السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد المرسلين uh, Good evening ladies and gentlemen It's my pleasure to welcome you in this scientific session My name is Abdul Halim Kinsar from the National Guard Hospital in Jeddah And today actually we're having a very hot topics which is about heart failure Now uh, heart failure is very, become a very prevalent both with systolic dysfunction and with preserved LP function and now we are always looking for to find a new, a new method of treatment we are fo fo focusing on how we can discharge the patient earlier with looking for how the thing which improves the mortality so it's really our pleasure actually today we have one of the experts in that field dr sabu verma actually he does not need introduction but i will tell you briefly about him what's unique about him. He is a professor of uh, cardiac surgery and pharmacology at University of Toronto and St. Mike. Sabu actually had a great interest in the research. He has been serving as a chair, as a chair of the Canadian Research Committee for 10 years. He has been involved in major trial about SGL2 inhibitor. So he was not involved only in one medication, but he has been involved in more than one medication. So with that, and you see his publication has been extensively in all highly ranked journal. So having such kind of expert, I'm sure he will, will learn a lot from him. We will have a better understanding of this new class. Would like to know, is this a diabetic medication or should be a cardiac medication that has been, had been lied wrongly in the diabetic field? And I think this will be really a very interesting discussion that is we're going to have after his presentation. Now, before we start the meeting, we have a few questions. I'd like to hear your opinion about it. So could we have the boot, please? Great. So I'd like you kindly just uh, reply to this question by yes or no. I'll just read it for some of you who might not have a, a clear view. I believe that heart failure patients in Saudi Arabia are having high ongoing risk of mortality and current standard of care have several limitations to control mortality and patient symptoms. So please say yes or no, click in yes or no. That will should directly to the second question, which is I am aware of DABHF trial and that SGL2 inhibitor have an evidence and effective in treatment of the heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, where they are, whether they are diabetic or not, whether they are diabetic or not. So please reply yes or no. The third question, I believe that based on the DABA HF trial, DABA is ahead of ARNI or heart failure with reduced ejection fraction patients? Yes or no? We we'll go to the question number four. I believe that dabagliflozine is superior than the embagliflozine in reducing cardiovascular death and improving in ejection uh, and improve heart failure with reduced ejection fraction patient. Both on the quality of life, which is the most important thing that is our patient will look for. So you think yes or no. The last question, I am willing to use DABA on the top of any standard care for the heart failure with reduced ejection fraction patient. Yes or no. So this is our last question to see what is uh, how we are approaching heart failure currently in Saudi Arabia. And we probably we're going to see is that your answer will change at the end of the presentation. So Noor, can we see the result? Okay, great. Like question number two, we see a little bit. Different opinion, similar as question three, question four, and and a little bit of question five. Well, that's great. So let us uh, hear from Professor Verma and see what is the update in this subject. Prof. Verma, the floor is yours. 
Well, uh, th thank you so much uh, for uh, your wonderful introduction. And I am really honored to uh, be speaking to all of you today in the kingdom. And it's so nice of you to be chairing this program uh, on behalf of the Saudi Heart Association. Uh, it's really been my uh, really distinct pleasure to be involved in this very exciting field uh, with respect to SGLT2 inhibitors in the treatment of heart failure. Can you see my uh, slides, Dr. Abdul Halim? Yes, yes, we do. Thank you. So as was mentioned, um, I have several disclosures, but uh, I have been involved in uh, leadership roles in, in the DAPA-HF trial, uh, as well as in uh, the Emperor trial and uh, some of the other ongoing trials that are currently listed. Uh, just one second. I think I have to reshare my screen. There's a little bit of a... So today's agenda, colleagues, uh, is to cover the following five topics. We want to talk a bit about the story of SGLT2 inhibitors in the prevention of heart failure. We want to talk about their role in the treatment of heart failure with or without diabetes. Maybe spend a few minutes talking about how do they actually work to reduce cardiovascular events, what are the clinical implications, and what are the ongoing studies. Now, I'm sure you will all agree with Professor Eugene Brownwald, who in 2014 in the Lancet lecture reminded us that we are at war against heart failure. It doesn't matter where we live in the world, this is a real war with heart failure, partly because of demographic aging, because of advances in coronary care globally, we know that there are 60 million patients with heart failure, and unfortunately, by 2030, we expect that that number will exceed 100 million. Heart failure, again, no matter where we reside, shortens life. It's very costly. And despite all of the therapies that we have in our armamentarium, the risk persists for cardiovascular death and recurrent heart failure hospitalizations. And that's why we need new therapies to reduce morbidity and mortality in patients with heart failure and a reduced or preserved ejection fraction. So let's start by telling you about the story of SGLT2 inhibitors. Again, as our chairman mentioned, the story really started in people with diabetes. And these were the four diabetes cardiovascular outcome trials that were done. There was Empareg, there was Canvas, Declare, Virtus. And what was very interesting is that the vast majority of the patients that were enrolled in these trials did not have heart failure, they just had diabetes and risk factors. And what was found was a very, very consistent observation as shown here at the very end that hospitalizations for heart failure were reduced by about 30% in people with diabetes who actually did not necessarily have heart failure. And this ushered in you know, a wonderful new era of using SGLT2 inhibitors in the prevention of patients uh, from a heart failure perspective. And some of these trials have really taken people in primary prevention, such as the DECLARE TIMI 58 study. What was equally surprising and remarkable was that not only was heart failure hospitalizations reduced, you see that kidney outcomes were affected in a very, very favorable fashion. At least in three of the trials, Empareg Outcome, Canvas, and Declare, you can see that there was almost a 50% improvement in the uh, sort of kidney outcomes on top of standard of care. So, you know, the field really evolved to say, if you take people with diabetes, whether you take them early or late, whether you take them with or without cardiovascular disease, it doesn't matter if you have diabetes, you can benefit from an SGLT2 inhibitor with respect to reduction in heart failure events and reduction and prevention of renal events. And then came the so-called outstanding questions that we're here to address today. We clearly knew that heart failure prevention is achievable in diabetes. But what was unclear, if I may, was does this class of medication actually work in the treatment of established heart failure? More specifically, can these drugs be used to treat 
prevalent heart failure rather than just prevent incident heart failure? And the second important question, are the benefits observed in all comers with and without diabetes? And that is the story of these three trials that we're going to talk about today. DAPA-HF, the Emperor Reduced, and then the Soloist trial. And I've really been distinctly privileged to be involved in all three of them and be a co-author on all three of these papers that were presented in the New England Journal of Medicine over the last few years. So let's talk a bit about the DAPA-HF trial. It's not that long ago, as you know, November 29th, 2019, were the primary results of the DAPA-HF trial that were presented in the New England Journal, dapagliflozin in patients with heart failure and reduced ejection fraction. You don't see the word diabetes here at all because this is not a diabetes trial. It is a heart failure trial where people can get in even if they have or don't have diabetes. And if you look at the 4,744 patients, you see that the use of diuretics was high, ACE, ARB, or ARNI was high, beta blocker was high, MRA use was very high. This was an exceedingly well-tolerated and well-treated population of patients with heart failure and an ejection fraction below 40%. And over a median follow-up of 18 months, you saw that those individuals who got dapagliflozin 10 milligrams per day versus standard of care had a 26% reduction, highly statistically significant, an NT of 21 with respect to the composite outcome of CV death or worsening heart failure. But I think the first key take home message is this slide that the two individual components of the primary outcome, worsening heart failure, was reduced by 30% highly statistically significant, and cardiovascular death, which is the distinction of DAPA-HF compared to emperor reduced or soloist, was reduced by 18%, and that too was statistically significant. Uh, I was, again, very, very fortunate and, uh, and really honored, if I may, to be uh, the co-lead of the next important analyses that we published in JAMA that was looking at people without diabetes. And I think you would agree, this was the second most important question that needed to be addressed. And what we found was that half of the patients who did not have diabetes and the other half that had diabetes, they had completely similar benefit of dapagliflozin. We looked at this even more carefully, looking at A1C continuously. If someone's A1C was five, or someone A1C was 12, it made absolutely no difference whatsoever. The benefit was entirely consistent in people with or without diabetes and those with prediabetes or even those with entirely normal A1C. So this introduces for the first time, I would say cogent data to suggest that dapagliflozin's benefit in HEFREF patients is not only on top of standard of care, but is completely independent of the level of glycemic control in these patients. There was another paper that was led by Dr. Felipe Martinez, which was looking at the efficacy in DAPA according to age. And as you know, HEFREF uh, usually is a disease of elderly patients in many cases. And in people who are elderly, we worry about safety and efficacy. And therefore, this was a really important publication in circulation from the DAPA-HF trial that demonstrated that irrespective of age, 40 and higher, you see that there was a completely consistent benefit of dapagliflozin. There's no less or greater benefit of dapagliflozin in younger or older patients. But really in elderly patients, what we worry about is volume depletion side effects. And what you see here is in fact, in those individuals over the age of 75, volume depletion side effects were similar and volume depletion related serious side effects were in fact fewer 
with dapagliflozin versus placebo. The other thing we worry about in elderly people is renal safety. And it turns out that serious renal adverse events were 10 times less in those treated with dapagliflozin compared to placebo. Doubling of serum creatinine was also about seven times lower in those individuals with heart failure who got dapagliflozin versus placebo and those that were over the age of 75. Now, one of the other reasons to treat patients with heart failure is not just to extend life, but to also improve symptoms. And the one way of evaluating symptoms is using what we call the KCCQ uh, total summary score. It's a patient reported outcome that evaluates symptoms of heart failure. And what was found is that those individuals who got dapagliflozin had less deterioration and more improvement, five, 10, or 15 point improvement uh, in the KCCQ summary score with NNTs that were very, very small. So what does this tell us? That dapagliflozin extends life, it reduces heart failure hospitalizations, it does that on top of standard of care, and it also makes people feel better. Now, what about recurrent events? You know, after someone has had a heart failure hospitalization, they often go on to have another hospitalization, a third hospitalization, and eventually, unfortunately, may pass away. And in this recurrent event analysis, you can see whether people had diabetes or no diabetes. There was a clear 23% or 27% reduction in the first and repeat hospitalizations in people who got dapagliflozin or placebo. Now, I think one of the next very important sub-analyses refers to background therapy because the question is, are these wonderful results actually seen on top of uh, you know, standard of care? And this was another paper we published in the European Heart Journal last year. Uh, and this was presented at one of the meetings looking at the efficacy according to background heart failure therapy. And what we found was whether people were on a diuretic, an MRA, DIG, ARMI, Evabradine, the benefit is entirely consistent and basically on top of complementary to these various background therapies. Even when we looked at the dose, ACE inhibitor dose of more than 50%, beta blocker dose of more than 50%, MRA dose of more than 50%, whether someone had an ICD or a CRT device, there's an entirely consistent benefit telling us that dapagliflozin is not competing with other therapies. It is complementary and really additive to all of the things that we do at the right doses for our patients. We also looked in this paper in those individuals who got, for example, ACE, ARB, beta blocker, and MRA, triple combination. There is an entirely consistent benefit. We looked at people who got ACE, ARB at target dose plus an MRA. You also see a consistent benefit. And then we looked at people who got an ARNI, beta blocker and MRA, and you still see a consistent benefit. So dapagliflozin's benefit is really on top of these background therapies. The next analysis refers to the systolic blood pressure analysis, and that is asking the question, is the benefit consistently seen across the blood pressure domain? And Overall, what we found is that there's a very small, about 2.2 millimeter drop in systolic blood pressure, maybe a little bit more so in people who are hypertensive, where you see about a four millimeter drop in blood pressure, but overall the blood pressure drops are quite small. But importantly, what you see here is that whether someone's blood pressure was 90 or whether it was really elevated, again, the baseline level of blood pressure is no way determinant of the efficacy of dapagliflozin in this regard. 
Now, we've also done some NT-proBNP analyses, and what we found was that there was a significant drop in NT-proBNP, but that number was quite modest. It was only about 303 picograms per mil, which is very small. Uh, it was statistically significant, but this tells us that the mechanism of benefit of dapagliflozin is likely not through naturesis per se. It's likely not through diuresis per se. It must be through a different mechanism that we'll talk about. Now, one of the other reasons why we think that the benefit is not through naturesis is because when we looked at people with the highest level of NT-proBNP or those with low levels of NT-proBNP, there was actually, again, a very consistent benefit, straight line. And what that tells us is that if this was a mechanism that was primarily driven through naturesis, you would expect a greater benefit in those with higher NT-proBNP, which was not the case. What about BMI? Some have said that dapagliflozin or empagliflozin should be used in people who are overweight because it has a uh, effect to reduce weight. And I think that's a reasonable sort of postulation. But what we found in DAPA-HF was whether the BMI was sort of 17 or 20 normal or whether someone's BMI was elevated, dapagliflozin's efficacy was entirely consistent again. So this is not a therapy that needs to be restricted to obese or overweight patients with diabetes or those with overweight patients with HEFREF. The benefit seems to be seen in all comers, irrespective of BMI. Now, what about the etiology of heart failure? And as you know, we often think about so-called ischemic and non-ischemic etiology. And we looked at that carefully in this analyses. And what we found is that irrespective of whether someone had an ischemic etiology or a non-ischemic etiology, there was a consistent benefit of dapagliflozin. So it's not a therapy that needs to, again, be restricted to someone with an ischemic cardiomyopathy. Anyone with HEFREF from any cause can actually benefit in this regard. What about outcomes by sex? Again, women, <clears throat> as shown here, and men, as shown here, you see again a very consistent benefit in men and women. I think this was an important analysis because in HEFPEF, there have been some differences based on sex, and in this case, we did not find any of those. Now, a very important analysis that we've just published in circulation looks at what happened to diuretic dose. And again, we don't think that the predominant mechanism of action here is <clears throat> diuresis per se. And in fact, you can see that the baseline furosemide equivalent dose in these patients was about 60 milligrams. And over the course of the trial, there was a modest reduction in furosemide dose. <clears throat> in fact, the vast majority of patients actually had a similar uh, furosemide dose at the beginning and at the completion of the trial. And that tells us that, you know, again, uh, the mechanism of benefit is not diuresis. And unlike what many of us, including me, had thought that we would see a very marked reduction in loop diuretic dose, which is not the case here. We also looked at patients who had uh, who received no diuretic versus those who received any dose of diuretic, less than 40, 40 milligrams or greater than 40 milligrams, very consistent benefit uh, for all of the outcomes that are listed here. Now, one very important point that I want to make to you here is that there is a rise in hematocrit that is observed with these therapies. And that rise in hematocrit that is seen with dapagliflozin actually seems to be seen across whether people have a increase, decrease, or no change in diuretic. It's a very, very important question because we believe that the benefit of SGLT2 inhibitors may be in part driven through an increase in erythropoietin production. And in fact, irrespective of whether you have a decrease or an increase or no change in diuretic, you see that the trajectory is that 
the hematocrit goes up. And we believe that DAPA and EMPA actually stimulate the release of erythropoietin, which then could be a very powerful mechanism of cardiovascular protection. Now some new data for you, and that is looking at the magic heart failure risk calculator. And as you know, uh, people don't come as age or sex or diabetes or BMI, they come with all of these different risk factors. So integrating these risk factors by a magic risk factor calculator can help us synthesize whether somebody is at low, intermediate, or high risk. And what we find here in the DAPA-HF trial is whether someone's overall magic heart failure risk score is low, whether it's intermediate, whether it's high, this is a therapy that derives a similar benefit across all levels of risk in the context of a patient with HEF-REF. <clears throat> we have recently also presented these intriguing data of COPD. As you know, that COPD has very common, is commonly seen in this population of patients. Oftentimes, COPD has common underlying pathophysiology. What we found is that those individuals who have heart failure and COPD have a very, very poor outcome. And those who get dapagliflozin in the context of COPD had a profound reduction in the cardiovascular outcomes and an improvement in symptoms. This is important because as you know, in COPD, sometimes beta blockers cannot be used. Steroids are difficult to use in the context of uh, patients with diabetes where they can worsen A1C control. So I think this is a unique kind of observation that tells us that those patients are particularly well poised to derive benefit in this regard. Now in heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, particularly when you add an MRA, you worry about hyperkalemia. And in this very intriguing observation, we found that in fact, the incidence of hyperkalemia in those who were treated with an MRA was lower. And the incidence of hyperkalemia with a threshold of over six was also lower. So adding dapagliflozin to an MRA, you don't have to worry about hyperkalemia. If anything, it provides a little bit of room because it lowers potassium in this regard. And just a few days ago in diabetes care, we have now presented these new data. Uh, sorry, the citation is not up yet, but the paper is now published looking at the incidence of new onset diabetes in patients with out diabetes at baseline. So in DAPA-HF, we found that those individuals with heart failure and reduced ejection fraction that did not have diabetes, that there was actually a 32% reduction in new diabetes in this context. And those individuals in which diabetes was prevented actually uh, had a significantly lower risk of mortality and cardiovascular death. Now, the story of DAPA-HF continues with looking at those individuals who've had a prior hospitalization for heart failure. And as you know, if you've been hospitalized for heart failure in the preceding 12 months, uh, you actually are at very high risk for recurrent events. And 27% of patients in DAPA-HF had a hospitalization for heart failure in the preceding 12 months. And 20% had a hospitalization for heart failure uh, more than 12 months ago. And what you see here is that if you look at a patient who has had a recent heart failure hospitalization, DAPA reduces the primary outcome by close to 40% with an absolute risk reduction of about 10%. If you've had any history of heart failure hospitalization, close to 30% reduction with a 4% absolute risk reduction. So hot patients derive even a greater benefit in terms of absolute and relative risk reduction with dapagliflozin. Now, what about the ejection fraction? As you know, it was an ejection fraction of 40 and below is what was studied in the trial. And what we found was that the benefit again was entirely consistent across the spectrum of ejection fractions below 40%. 
One of the most commonly asked questions is what about an Arni or Sacubitril Valsartan? Are the benefits additive to this? And the answer to that is absolutely. The numbers are small, but you can see that there is no heterogeneity in this post hoc subgroup. There is a consistent benefit in those with treated ARNI or not without an ARNI in this regard. What about the safety of using dapagliflozin with sacubitril valsartan? And you can see here that those patients taking sacubitril valsartan are shown here. And if you look at systolic blood pressure, there's actually really no change. If you look at creatinine, again, there's no change. And potassium, there's no change. So from a systolic blood pressure perspective, from a renal perspective, and from a potassium perspective, you have nothing to worry about when adding dapagliflozin to an ARNI. What about kidney function. Now, I forgot to mention that in DAP-IHF, we recruited patients down to a GFR of 30 mils per minute per 1.73 meters square. And what we found in this trial was whether people's GFR was above 60 or below 60, the benefit was entirely consistent. What about the effects on renal function? There was a trend, but this was not statistically significant primarily because of the numbers of patients, but there was a 29% reduction in the hazard ratio uh, with respect to the renal composite outcome. But then when we looked at the slope in the adapagliflozin treated patients, you see here that uh, placebo HEFREF patients, this is their eGFR slope decline over time. And dapagliflozin patients, as you can see here, they have an initial drop, but then they stabilize their eGFR such that the differences in eGFR slope decline are highly statistically significant in keeping with, of course, uh, what we know from DAPA CKD and other trials that this is a therapy that improves renal function. So colleagues, there have been just a wonderful array of sub-analyses and papers, some of which I've shared with you today. Based on these results, the US Food and Drug Administration on May 5th, 2020, has now indicated dapagliflozin not only in the treatment of type two diabetes, but a separate indication now exists for dapagliflozin in the treatment of heart failure with a reduced ejection fraction with or without diabetes down to a GFR of 30. On the 15th of October last year, the European Medicines Agency has also indicated for SIGA for the treatment of heart failure with reduced ejection fraction uh, on top of standard of care down to a GFR of 30. And in Canada, uh, on June 29th, 2020, dapagliflozin was indicated in people with or without diabetes down to a GFR of 30 in patients with HEFREF. And the CCS, Canadian Cardiovascular Society, heart failure guidelines uh, provided strong recommendations in people with and without diabetes to use dapagliflozin. DAPA is now approved in many countries. This is an older slide, but you can see that it is now also approved in Saudi Arabia. I've just added uh, the Saudi Arabia flag to this slide at the uh, very right-hand corner, but many other countries are now on board with respect to approval. Uh, so as I conclude DAPA HF, I'd like to say that this is a rigorous practice-changing and paradigm-shifting trial. It's a large trial. It's a persuasive p-value. It's highly internally consistent in all subgroups. The effect size is large. There's mortality reduction, improvement in quality of life on top of standard of care, similar benefits in people with and without diabetes, approximately a 50% reduction in acute kidney injury, and it's entirely safe without any volume depletion side effects. So along with Professor Deepak Bat and Professor Eugene Brownwald, uh, we wrote this editorial calling DAPA HF a momentous victory in the war against heart failure 
and really reminding us that when we think about foundational pillars of heart failure, we must now think about dapagliflozin with or without type 2 diabetes. Now, very briefly, we have also recently presented the results of the Emperor Reduced Trial. And I was on the steering committee of this trial and one of the co-authors led by Professor Milton Packer. This was a really important trial as well of more advanced patients with HEFREF uh, demonstrating that there was a statistically significant 25% reduction in the outcome of heart failure or CB death composite over 16 months with empagliflozin versus placebo. When we look at the primary composite outcome, it was highly statistically significant. This was driven mostly through a 31% reduction in heart failure, but there was a numeric, but not statistically significant reduction in CV death. Now, whether that is just a play of chance or duration of therapy or uh, background therapy remains unclear, but this is one of the distinguishing features between the two trials. So when we do look at Emperor Reduced and you look at DAPA-HF, they're very similar for many of the outcomes that are listed here where there are differences relate to cardiovascular death. And again, that may just be an issue of power and all-cause mortality. But otherwise, I think they tell us a very clear message that SGLT2 inhibitors have come of age in the treatment of HEF-REF. And in this regard, the latest update from the Heart Failure Association of the ESC on SGLT2 inhibitors and heart failure in their position paper, they state that DAPA or EMPA are recommended to reduce the combined risk of heart failure and CV death in symptomatic patients with HEFREF already receiving goal-directed medical therapy, regardless of whether they have type 2 diabetes. So in the last five minutes, let me just uh, remind you that the DAPA-HF trial applies to the following groups of patients. Patients with chronic ambulatory heart failure with reduced ejection fraction with or without diabetes, a GFR of over 30, and those that still have symptoms. But I often get asked this question, Dr. Verma, should I use dapagliflozin in stable patients with heart failure and a reduced ejection fraction? And remember, what do you mean by stable? Stable is really a misperception when it comes to heart failure. And in fact, this is an excerpt from one of the recent editorials that talks about the term stable heart failure should be progressively removed from the medical charts and guidelines to avoid the misperception that stability carries good prognosis. Instead, the term optimized versus non-optimized should be introduced in medical charts to keep us alert that optimization of guideline-directed medical therapy is the only way to slow or halt disease progression. So DAPA-HF took patients with class two symptoms that were ambulatory and over 18 months, look at how high the event rates were in the placebo well-treated population. This is not a population that is stable. Therefore, using this therapies in most patients with HEFREF would be important. Others have said, I will reserve dapagliflozin for those with low EF and high NT pro BNP. And I just want to remind you that there is no difference in benefit if someone has an EF of 38 or 20. There's no need to reserve this for very high risk patient with very low EF. And likewise, there's no reason to restrict it to someone with the highest level of NT pro BNP, since even those with lower levels of NT pro BNP seem to derive a similar benefit. <laughs> when should the treatment be initiated? And, uh, you know, this is just a cartoon. One day or day one, you decide. It's, uh, you know, a, uh, a poster that is in one of my daughter's bedrooms. My wife has put that in her bedroom to encourage her, uh, you know, to take action uh, as quickly as possible. And it really, you know, relates to sort of getting her work done and, 
education and schoolwork and things like that. But I think it applies to all of us that there's no need to be waiting. Uh, and the reason for that is that in the DAPA HF trial, we looked at the first 100 days. And what we found is that by day 28, there was a statistically significant benefit of dapagliflozin on the primary outcome of CV death and heart failure. Now, finally, uh, one of the most influential papers that I've read in my career is this one in The Lancet. And I strongly recommend you to have a look at this. It is trying to estimate whether all of these therapies comprehensively make a difference. And what they did in this analysis was to ask the question that if you look at comprehensive therapy, the Cadillac of therapy, which is a neprilysin inhibitor, MRA, SGLT2 inhibitor, uh, you know, as we would imagine, versus just conventional therapy, which is a RAS blocker and a beta blocker in heart failure, there is a difference in a 55-year-old patient of 6.3 years of life. And I think that is a profound, profound observation that state-of-the-art integration of these four medications can, in a 55-year-old patient, extend their life by more than 10%, which I think is a very, very important message for us to take action. So we don't have the new guidelines yet, but some may argue that maybe these therapies need to be really focused up front as opposed to sequentially. And uh, the Indian guidelines have taken this approach, which is not uh, sort of sequential, but it is everybody sits around the table. Everyone should be having access to, you know, an ACE, an ARB, an epirlysin inhibitor, MRA, beta blocker, loop diuretic, SGLT2 inhibitor, more in a horizontal fashion as opposed to a vertical integration pathway. Cardiologists who are on the line today need to know that this does not cause hypoglycemia in patients without diabetes. It does not precipitate DKA in non-diabetic patients. The rates of hypoglycemia and DKA are very low in people with, uh, in people yeah, even with type 2 diabetes and know the precipitants of what causes uh, you know, um, uh, decay in this regard. They do not cause hypovolemia. They do not cause hyponatremia or hyperkalemia. Of all of the therapies you have, this is one of the best and easiest one to use in HFREF. Also, it is important for cardiologists to communicate to patients the added benefits that if you have diabetes, it will help glycemic control. If you don't have diabetes, it may prevent you from developing new diabetes. It will improve renal function and reduce the decline in renal function. And there is no dose titration that is required, 10 milligrams and you're at target dose. Now I don't have time today to go into the detailed mechanisms of how these agents work, but this has been an area of tremendous interest in our group. And we know that there are so-called potential indirect mechanisms through improving renal function, improving progenitor provascular cells, release of EPO, which we think is quite important, reduction in sympathetic nervous system activity, improved myocardial energetics. And then there are the so-called direct effects on the heart through inhibiting the sodium hydrogen exchanger, reducing CAM kinase 2 delta, stimulating mitophagy and autophagy in the myocytes and reducing the NLRP3 inflammasome, all of which can have benefits in heart failure. Now, I'd like to just end by saying that earlier is likely better. And uh, this is from one of our recent papers in ESC heart failure just published in December after the soloist trial, reminding you that DAPA, HF, and Emperor reduced really actually enrolled patients uh, in the ambulatory setting. Uh, and what about using patients, uh, uh, you know, in hospital, uh, whether these therapies should be used? And there was a trial called Soloist Worsening Heart Failure that was done that asked that question specifically uh, that pre-discharge 
or within three days of discharge. And what was found again in this paper uh, that we published just recently in the New England Journal, that in fact, the primary efficacy outcome of total CV death, heart failure, hospitalization, urgent heart failure visit was reduced with sodagliflozin, which is an SGLT2, SGLT1 inhibitor, not available yet and not marketed. But I would essentially look at soloist and say the same would apply to DAP IHF or emperor reduced using this in a earlier setting would be important. Now, remember, this was a trial of only people with diabetes, but it included people with or without heart failure, uh, with or without HEF-REP. So I'd like to bring this story to conclusion by saying that the journey of SGLT2 inhibitors in heart failure has been a really wonderful one. It has started with people with diabetes and it asked the question, can we take SGLT2 inhibitors and prevent heart failure? And that was clear, we could do that. And then we asked the question, what about taking people with established heart failure? DAPA HF, emperor reduced, soloist, and it was clear that we could treat heart failure in this population and that benefit would be seen in people with and without diabetes. So just be cognizant colleagues, and uh, this is uh, a message for all of us, including me and including all of our viewers, that clinical inertia equals bad outcomes. And you know, this constant fascination, oh, my patient is stable, or let's reassess him in a few months, or I think I'll restrict this therapy to people with diabetes, or maybe it causes hypoglycemia. These can be oftentimes excuses, uh, and sometimes it might just be us trying to say, hopefully someone else will do it. But we have to be really responsible and accountable to our patients to do the right thing in this regard. So Professor Packer and I have said the following in this cartoon, uh, you know, four weeks, four drugs, are you up for the challenge? And beta blocker, RNA, MRAS, GLT2 inhibitor need to be integrated quickly. They don't have to be integrated at the top dose, but we need to integrate these diverse ways of thinking. And let me end by showing you Professor McMurray and Packer. Professor McMurray led DAP IHF and Professor Packer led Emperor Reduced. And just a few days ago in circulation, they have put forward their viewpoint of sequencing. This is our conventional sequencing, ACE, R, beta blocker, MRA, uh, RNA, SGLT2, usually takes six months or more. And their proposed new sequencing, and you would agree that these are the world authorities in heart failure, they have suggested that maybe step one should be a beta blocker and SGLT2 inhibitor followed by an RNA, followed by an MRA. And that all three steps, as opposed to one, two, three, four, five, step one, two, and three should be achieved within four weeks. And after you have these therapies on board, then you can up titrate to target doses thereafter, but get the patients on the right therapy, therapeutic class quickly in the context of heart failure and reduced ejection fraction. So the important take home messages today, SGLT2 inhibitors reduce the risk of heart failure hospitalizations and CV death. SGLT2 inhibitors improve and prevent worsening of symptoms. They slow deterioration in kidney function. Critically or crucially, these benefits are on top of conventional therapy, including sacubitril, valsartan, and dapagliflozin is now indicated in the treatment of HEFREF in Saudi Arabia. I just heard this wonderful news a few days ago, and uh, I think this is the official slide that was shared to me by uh, AstraZeneca that just reminds you that this is now a therapy approved for this purpose. So my very last slide, uh, again, thank you to our chairman and to all of us, all of you ladies and gentlemen, all close to a thousand people who are online today, that we've talked a lot about treating, but at the end of the day, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. We need to be cognizant that at least in people with diabetes, SGLT2 inhibitors actually have the ability to prevent heart failure. 
And if people develop heart failure, then of course, these strategies are still available. With that, I'll hand it back to you, Dr. Abdul Halim, and I'm happy to take any questions that you may have in this regard. Thank you very much, Sabu. It was really a great uh, and very interesting presentation. And it was very educational, actually. We learn a lot from it. Uh, thank you very much for keeping us updated. Thank you very much for taking us through the whole journey, actually. We have uh, really many questions, but first of, of, uh, I would like to start with the bull first. So can we try uh, the audience to answer the question again and see if we are having any difference? So do you believe the burden is high and are we have several limitation? Yes, no. Now, if you said that, let us go to the second question. Do you think they are effective in both diabetic and non-diabetic based on the presentation that you heard from Professor Verma? Okay, question number three. Do you, do you, are you planning to use it ahead of ARNI? Question number four. What about the superiority to the over EMBA in terms of quality of life and cardiovascular death? And the last question, are you willing to use it in the top? Remember the last slide, four in four. So let us see what's your answer now. Some of the question actually has been answered by you, but it's nice just uh, to elaborate on them again. Now, uh, the first question, which is you answered in the three slides before the end, uh, how we can use DABA? Shall we use it at hospitalization or when the symptom is worsening? I think this is a wonderful question. I, I, I think at our institution, we are getting more comfortable in using it in hospital prior to discharge. Uh, so if you're seeing most of your patients with HFRF, you know, the ambulatory setting, either new or those that have, uh, you know, heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, that's easy to add there. But if you have a patient who's come in with worsening heart failure after they have been optimized, but prior to discharge, after they're off their IV Lasix, et cetera, that would be a wonderful time to initiate these therapies in hospital. Because as you know, starting therapies in hospital allows you to monitor things a bit better. Also, once you get started, then you're on it. It actually helps overcome inertia in this regard. Agree with you, especially like our patient might lose the follow-up or the follow-up might for one reason or other will be uh, delayed. So I think uh, starting it uh, at the hospital will be a great thing. Now, the second question is to the use of DABA on the top of ARNI or as a replacement? Yeah, so I, I think that um, it is not a replacement. It is uh, an addition. It just requires us to think about the sequence. Does it come before or after? And in some patients, it will come before and some patients, it will come after. If you have a patient with HEFREF who is already on an ARNI, but not on an SGLT2 inhibitor, I would add it without any concern. If someone is a new patient with HEFREF, I think that that patient can potentially derive benefit. If they have diabetes, it's a no-brainer. They should just get an SGLT2 inhibitor anyway. You've got to treat the glucose. So that would be something that would be upstream in that population. If someone is on an ACE or an ARB and a beta blocker and an MRA, I would probably add an SGLT2 inhibitor ahead of an ARNI in that situation. And if someone's potassium is elevated, you know, again, I would probably be more likely to use an SGLT2 inhibitor as opposed to an MRA in that context, just because of the lower risk of hyperkalemia. And finally, it also is a volume issue, right? If someone's blood pressure is 100 or 110, uh, sometimes RNAs can be harder to use from a blood pressure standpoint in that context. So uh, using an SGLD2 inhibitor may create uh, an opportunity there because it does not lower blood pressure uh, to the same extent. Yeah, great. Thank you very much. Uh, I think you pointed rightly to the situation where we have a difficulty 
use ACE inhibitor or ARP or ARNI, like when you're having a, a low, very low GFR or high creatinine, high potassium, I think uh, the SGL2 inhibitor will really be, uh, in that case, um, a nice option. The question here, which is a little bit interesting, and uh, uh, but I think this uh, lecture of today should, if there was 1,000 people, should make uh, a difference. He's, uh, he's asking, seeing all that benefit in diabetes, why is still most of the doctor prescribing metform, metformin to the patient like me? It seems the guy is uh, having a diabetes. And he's asking, is there any guideline when a doctor to prescribe this drug? Right. So it's a very uh, interesting question. You know, there's a lot of uh, uh, there's a lot of controversy on this, if I may. But uh, there's also a lot of emotion, right? Uh, there's a lot of uh, emotional attachment to metformin uh, as opposed to scientific uh, uh, attachment per se. And uh, as you know, it is hard sometimes to fight with emotion. Uh, and it usually that wins over science. Uh, that's just my sort of, uh, it's not a joke, but I really do think that is the case here. Uh, but the sentimental value around metformin has been questioned by the ESC guidelines, the European Society of Cardiology guidelines in 2019. They suggested that metformin uh, is not absolutely required in people with diabetes who are either at high risk or very high risk or those that have established disease. So high risk primary prevention or even secondary prevention, you can go straight to an SGLT2 inhibitor or a GLP-1-RA and bypass the need for metformin. Um, the recent American Diabetes Association meeting uh, uh, guidelines again in 2021, again, they emphasize that metformin use is uh, foundational primarily because it's uh, inexpensive and primarily because we have many years of uh, you know, follow-up with it we just don't have the cardiovascular and renal outcome data with it thus far. And so in a patient with diabetes, I, I think that the use of metformin in combination with an SGLT2 inhibitor is a wonderful combination early on or at any level because it prevents heart failure, prevents renal deterioration. And in a patient who has heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, there is no requirement for them to be on metformin, whether they have diabetes or not they can go straight to using this therapy. Thank you very much. I think this is the whole idea of having such webinars. So I'd like really to thank the organizing company AstraZeneca for this, because it really educates us and educates, especially the general uh, practitioner, family physician, of the importance uh, of using this uh, group of drugs. And as you mentioned, uh, the American Diabetic Association by, in their guideline, as getting you the option to start a SGL2 inhibitor from the beginning in certain situation. That's correct. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Yeah. The next question, he said, if a patient has been started on DAVA, do we need to modify any of their diabetic medication? Yeah, it's a great question. So uh, I think that if they're on DAVA, um, if their A1C is not at target, then I don't think you need to modify anything. If their uh, A1C is at target and they're on insulin, you know, oftentimes we say maybe, uh, you know, you can consider reducing the dose of insulin by 10 to 20%, not much more than that. You don't necessarily want to get rid of insulin because you can get into trouble in those patients. Uh, but I personally try to get rid of sulfonylureas if possible. You know, this is my pet peeve. Uh, you know, if we can get people off SUs, that would be wonderful, just because they have very limited data, if any, with respect to cardiovascular renal protection. And as you know, uh, the, the data with respect to weight gain, even with glycoside or glimepiride, is still clearly present. Great. Uh, just about the emphasis about the diuretics, do you think we need to modify the dose of diuretic if we started DAVA? Yeah, great question. Again, uh, personally, we used to do a lot of that before the trial results came out, where we used to say, 
you know, cut the dose of Lasix in half and, you know, continue hydrochlorothiazide. But in the clinical trials, we didn't do any of that. And uh, we found that organically, the doses of diuretics did go down and new initiation or new intensification of diuretics was lower. So I don't at this point really recommend that we need to do any of that uh, with respect to uh, patients on diuretics. It does not get people into any trouble whatsoever. Okay, great. You said that the restriction is, is lim restricted in patients with low GFR less than 30. But one of the questions here he's asking, what about the hemodialysis with low EF? Yeah, good question. Not studied yet, sir. It's just we don't have the data yet. So I would, you know, um, in DAPA-HF, we went down to 30. and Emperor reduced, we went down to 20. But uh, we do not have data beyond that. Uh, next question, they're asking, which investigation are necessary before starting DABA? Really, I think you want to make sure that the patient does not have type 1 diabetes. You know, uh, other than that, from my perspective, there is really, uh, if you're using it for diabetes, I just don't think we should be using it for type 1 diabetes. Uh, for type 2 diabetes, you don't really need any investigations prior to starting. And in a patient with heart failure, as long as they have a diagnosis of HEFREF, there's no further investigations required. Okay, the next question is a little bit, um, just to emphasize, saying a patient with uncontrolled type two diabetes, can you use DABA? And of course the answer is yes. You can, you know, but if someone has really high sugars and is toxic and then those people oftentimes require to go to hospital and they need to be treated with insulin first and then cool down and then switch to oral therapy. Okay. Uh, in patients with diabetic who's on insulin, can we use a da a DABA2? Yes, who's not, but as long as they don't have uh, type 1 diabetes. Type 1. Um, now, when we use DABA, we are relying on the GFR rather than the creatinine, correct? That's correct, yeah. Yeah, because the question here, what is the creatinine level that is safely uh, to use DABA, so? I think I would just, you know, as you know, that's a bit of a, the calculations can be complicated sometimes, mm -hmm. but GFR of 30 and, you know, usually what would that, in most people that would sort of probably be, you know, a creatinine of, I don't know what units you use, micromoles or? Uh, Using millimole per deciliter. Millimole per deciliter. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm not sure what that would be, uh, but I think in what, uh, what what about in milligram per deciliter? Yeah, I, I think I think like I would probably say like you know 200 or you know something around that that mm -hmm. level. Okay, great. Uh, this is an interesting question. In urinary tract infection, uh, is it an indication to hold this GL2 inhibitor, or just simply we treat and resume? the treatment later? Again, great question. So uh, the drug uh, was initially suspected that it may cause UTIs, but it does not. Uh, it causes an increase in genital infections, fungal infections, but urinary tract infections have actually not been higher uh, by the, the therapy per se. If someone has a UTI, I would just continue it. Just like if someone has genital tract infections, we just continue it, treat the UTI or treat the genital infection, concomitant with treatment. Okay, great. Uh, another interesting question is uh, the combination with uh, GLAR gene. Uh, he said, uh, uh, after seeing the great benefit on the cardiac and renal in type two diabetes, a uh, patient who has been restarted recently uh, on glargine, dabagliflozine, could we give, could be that given simultaneously or we have to replace each other? No, I, I, I think that uh, they can be given simultaneously, uh, but I, I would probably refer to our friendly endocrinologists to give some guidance in this regard. You know, I get a bit nervous when you're trying to start. I don't usually start insulin and DAPA myself together. I would probably phone one of my friends 
from endocrinology and say, can you please come and see this patient from that perspective? Majority of us actually do so. We refer them to endocrinology when it comes to a different combination of medication. Uh, uh, as question related to the pathology, is obesity related to heart failure? Yeah, it's a great question. I think that HEF-PEF uh, is a disease where obesity plays a very important role from a pathophysiological standpoint. And uh, many of the uh, sort of common mechanisms of heart failure with preserved ejection fraction would seem to be related to visceral adiposity and uh, you know the accumulation of adipokines and adipocytokines and so there's a lot of literature pathophysiologically that suggests that obesity is causally related to the development of HEF-PEF. Uh, whether obesity treatments like semaglutide or others will reduce this outcome are currently being explored. Okay, a question is about heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. Where we see the SGL2 inhibitor? Right, so it's a great question. There are trials ongoing. There's the Emperor Preserve trial and the deliver trial that are ongoing that suggest uh, that will test whether uh, SGLT2 inhibitors are useful in HEF-PEF. Uh, the soloist trial that I showed you had people both with and without uh, HEF-PEF or HEF-REF, and there seemed to be a benefit in that context of the small subgroup of patients with HEF-PEF in that regard. Great. Now, the question is always, uh, come, do you think this medication should be a diabetic medication or a cardiology medication? You know, as, as they say, victory, victory has a thousand fathers, right? Uh, and so I think that everybody wants to be victorious here. The cardiologists feel that they are victorious, the endocrinologists, the uh, nephrologists, at the end of the day, I think it's a victory for the patients. No, it doesn't matter what we call them. I think they're, they're cardiorenal protective drugs um, and they work in people with and without diabetes. The DAPA CKD trial has also shown that in people with or without diabetes, it prevents renal disease. So uh, at least in my, in my career, this will go down as one of the most formidable uh, journeys of therapies that will can can change the trajectory of diabetes and heart failure and CKD. These are the three grievous diseases that are interrelated, as you know. Uh, growing numbers of diabetic patients, growing numbers of heart failure, growing number of renal disease. So this class intersects this really fatal triangle, no matter how you look at it. So. If you're a cardiologist, you should use it. If you're an endocrinologist, you should use it. If you're a primary care physician, you should use it early so that they don't end up showing up to the cardiologists with these problems. Uh, but I, I don't think I've answered your question, my friend, because I don't want to commit to are they diabetes drugs or cardiology drugs. I think they are cardiorenal -met metabolic uh, therapies. Uh, that work in across that spectrum. Okay. Now, where do you see the dose of five milligram of DABA? I haven't, we don't have it available. I've never used it. Uh, I would just use 10 milligrams. Okay. Uh, do you think these effect are class effect or they are um, restricted or um, peculiar to DABA? Uh, no, I, I think that, you know, again, this is a very, common question. There's a lot of similarities between them, right, in terms of uh, the benefit on heart failure and renal outcomes. There are some differences in the population of patients. There's differences in mortality reduction in DAPA-HF versus Emperor reduced. But I think that the fight is not between DAPA and EMPA or CANA. The fight is with inertia, right? and that is get the therapies on board in people with diabetes. And we know that in primary prevention, DAPA has the strongest body of evidence to prevent heart failure. And in people with, DAP, with CKD, DAPA has the strongest body of evidence to reduce mortality. And in patients with HEF-REF, DAPA reduces mortality. So 
if you are going to choose a winner, that is the winner. There's no doubt about it across all three. But if I had a patient come in on canagliflozin, would I switch him to DAPA? I don't think I would do that. I don't want to make things complicated for patients, but let's be honest. Uh, in 2021, DAPA has completed the full circle uh, of uh, you know, prevention to treatment in patients with and without diabetes and patients with and without heart failure, with or without CKD. Sabu, I think you really uh, uh, enriched this meeting. Thank you very Thank you. much. We enjoyed it. I have a lot of compliment for you, actually, in this uh, question, the site. They okay. thanking you for the great, your uh, nice presentation, the data you showed, and uh, your uh, continuous smile. Thank you very much. I will look forward, my friend, to seeing you in person. Jeddah sure. is one of my favorite places to visit because I love the restaurants there. Looking forward Among many to other that. things, and there's many friends there. So I very um, much look forward to seeing you in person. Last trip that I actually took, I was in Egypt, and I was supposed to fly to Saudi. And uh, I got through in Cairo, uh, I got through security, and uh, I was uh, just trying to get into uh, the board the flight. And this was in February or uh, in, in March, I think of this year. And it was just at that time that the kingdom had said that if you don't have an official visa, you can't come. Wow. So I had a tourist visa, so they actually sent me back from there. That, <laughs> so I, I'm, uh, I'm looking forward to it. And as you know, many of our colleagues uh, are now here at uh, St. Michael's Hospital as well. Uh, uh, from King sure. Saudi University, uh, you know, uh, who are actually in leadership roles at the hospital. So look forward to seeing you. Thank you very much. Would like really to thank the audience. They really uh, made the session a great one. Their questions were very stimulating. I'd like to thank the Saudi Heart and like to thank uh, AstraZeneca. And we hope by uh, this session, that is uh, the recent approval of the Saudi FDA we will use this drug more effectively and using more frequently. Thank you very much and enjoy the day. Have a good evening. Thank you. Bye-bye.